Hello. Welcome back. I'm Masood Raja. And today I'm uh, starting with a very ambitious project. My project is to record chapter by chapter discussions of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I know it's a really um, ambitious project, but I thought there is a need to really engage with this book personally, but then also to make it available to as many people as possible through my YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed to my channel, please make sure to subscribe at the bottom so that you can stay updated. But other than that, welcome and come and join me in this journey, which I think is likely to be a very exciting journey. Now, a few points uh, about how I plan to do it. So I don't just plan to do general discussions of the chapters. What I hope to do, and I hope you can stay with me throughout the process, is to read each chapter put it on the screen and read it with you. And then in the process of reading it, add my insights and my ideas and my understanding, limited as it is, of Freire's work. Now, I am not giving you much of an information about Paulo Freire because I'm assuming, or Paulo Freire, uh, because I'm assuming you already know of his significance. He was a Brazilian uh, educationist especially focused on the education of the poor and the oppressed, hence the title of his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But I will add a few links in the description of these videos for you to uh, go and read more about Freire's own life. Now, Freire is also considered the as the father figure of what is now considered the field of critical pedagogy. So even though he does not use the term in the pedagogy of the oppressed. So that's the project uh, to sum it up, to read each chapter carefully, word by word, maybe line by line, and then to add some of my comments and explanations to it. And then hope that you will have more questions and, uh, you know, more uh, points to add to this discussion. So I uh, here is to my plan and I'm going to put chapter one right there on screen. You can read it alongside of me or, you know, if you have the book, you can read it yourself. So here is how he starts chapter one, the pedagogy of the oppressed. And the first paragraph. While the problem of humanization has always, from an axiological point of view, been humankind's central problem, it now takes on the character of an inescapable concern. Concern for humanization lead at once to the recognition of dehumanization, not only as an ontological possibility, but as an historical reality. And as an individual perceives the extent of dehumanization, he or she may ask if humanization is a viable possibility. Within history, in concrete, objective context, both humanization and dehumanization are possibilities for a person as an uncompleted being conscious of their incompletion. So from the very start, there is a certain binary structures to it. There are certain assumptions that he is making, right? He has a certain one could call romantic uh, idea of being human, right? So that's the humanistic aspect of Freire's thought, that at the core of all of us is there that centralized humanity. A lot of post-structuralists and others people like us will have a problem with that assumption about humanity, like a natural inborn humanity. But what he's saying is that there are two competing ideas of humanity in an agonistic relationship. There is humanization, which, according to my understanding of Freire, is something in it. We all desire 
or self-actualization, becoming fully human. So that comes from, uh, you know, um, uh, the from uh, the works of Maslow and others, right? Uh, like the third wave uh, psychoanalysis or psychology, that that we attempt to self-actualize, right? And so that attempt to humanize ourselves is natural to us, according to my understanding here. But competing with it is the agonistic term, dehumanization, right? So our attempts to humanize ourself, all, ourselves always come in conflict with the dehumanizing forces in the world, right? And so that's the beginning from the very start. What we understand is that people are aware of the dehumanization and they are looking for possibilities for a person as an uncompleted being conscious. So how do they look for humanizing themselves, right? Let's go to the next paragraph. But while both humanization and dehumanization are real alternatives, only the first is people's vocation. This vocation is constantly negated yet is confirmed by the very negation. So let's stop there, right? So what is a vocation? Vocation is something that's not forced onto you. Vocation is something that you naturally or personally aspire to. So if we were going to call humanization a human vocation, we can generalize it and assume that all human beings aspire to perform their humanity, and hence humanization is not unnatural, right? It's the natural state of being human and aspiring to be fully realized humans, right? Dehumanization, on the other hand, according to Freire, yet it is, a, and it, how is it affirmed by the negation? Because the acts of dehumanization presuppose the human right, or the humanity, and all the actions, policies, and things done to, to withhold humanization then comes from outside. It's not necessarily a human vocation, vocation, but those attempts at dehumanization already acknowledge then that something such as humanization exists, right? It is thwarted by injustice, like humanization, what thwarts it, what stops it, injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. These are the things that thwart everyone's attempt at self-actualizing or humanizing themselves. Inju injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. It is affirmed by the yearning of the oppressed for freedom and justice, and by their struggle to recover their lost humanity. Right, so there is a certain degree of, of course, Marxian thought over here too that there is this agonistic relationship between humanization and the forces of dehumanization. Humanization is a human vocation, it is natural to us. We all aspire to it, we all struggle for it, but standing against it are the forces of dehumanization, and how do they? stop us from that self-actualization, that's Maslow's term, by the way, are through oppression, through injustice, through force, and through the brute violence of the oppressors. So that already is creating another binaristic structure, that of the oppressed and the oppressors, right? Hence the book's title, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So, so far, what we have encountered in the first two paragraphs is the two competing concepts or states of being, right? Humanization and dehumanization. Out of them, humanization is natural to humans. We all aspire to gain our full humanity. Dehumanization is enforced from outside, right? It's not natural but all dehumanizing strategies directly, directly or indirectly impede our acquisition of our full humanity, right? And that then creates these two classes of human beings, the oppressors and the oppressed. 
the oppressors are the one who control the systems of injustice, systems of coercion, systems of exploitation that preclude the attempts by the oppressed to claim their full humanity, right? So just the first two paragraphs. I will move on to the next paragraphs. Okay, so he, in the third paragraph, he goes on to further elaborate on the concept of dehumanization. And I read, dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also those, though in a different way, who have stolen it, right, is a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. Let's stop there. So dehumanization doesn't just mark the oppressed whose humanity has been taken over or overwritten, right? But in the process of doing so, the oppressors themselves become dehumanized. So we must apply this slightly differently to both the constituencies of oppressors and the oppressed, right? Because those who have stolen it, according to Freire, have also lost their humanity. And it is a distortion of the vocation by, of course, distortion because the vocation is to be a fully realized, completed self, right? So any impediment to it would be a distortion and dehumanization is a distortion to that. Now this distortion, and I'm reading, occurs within history. Okay, but it is not an historical vocation. Remember, it occurs in history, but it is not a historical vocation automatically means that it is imposed. Had it been a vocation, it would come naturally to us. So dehumanization, practices of dehumanization is historical, it's material, it happens in the world, but it is not vocational, it is enforced, it, it, it may be artificial, because it is imposed from outside. That's what he means, that it's not a vacation. Vocation, sorry, not a way. Indeed, to admit of dehumanization as an historical vocation would lead either to cynicism or total despair. How? Think of it this way. If we all thought, how many times you have heard it's an unfair world? Right? And if we buy into that, then what we are saying is that the natural tilt of the world, the natural balance of the world is unjust. And if we accept such assumptions as natural, then of course we will become cynical because we would realize no matter what we do, the world is going to be lopsided. It's going to be unjust. So that's what he means. That, that's why I, I've decided not to lecture on Freire, but to read Freire carefully, because every sentence here is loaded and carries deep meanings. So it's a, his but it is not a historical vocation because it is not natural. It is not what we aspire to. Dehumanization is imposed from outside. And if we buy into the idea that it is natural, then there is no hope for us, right? And that leads us to despair and cynicism. You might have met so many people in your life who believe, you know, everything is futile, futile because that's how the world is. That's what he means by it. The struggle for humanization, for the emancipation of labor, for the, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons would be would be meaningless. So if we agreed that dehumanization is a natural historical vocation, then all the struggles for humanization and emancipation of the poor and overcoming of alienation would pr pr prove fruit fruitless because we have already acknowledged that this is how the world is, right? That's why He's clearly stating that while humanization is a historical human vocation, dehumanization is not. And it is important to keep that in mind because then we can understand that dehumanization is a imposed structure, imposed intrusion into the natural aspiration and vocation towards humanity. 
right? This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in turn dehumanizes the oppressed. So let's stop there, right? So dehumanization is a process, is material. It has agents who impose their will on the oppressed. And acknowledging that then creates a possibility for the oppressed, right? to develop strategies, to learn to challenge the injustices. And you can only do that if you believe, if you have faith that the natural telos of our human existence is for each one of us to claim our full humanity. And that any impediment to it, any blockage to it is not part of the natural processes but that it's imposed by powers that be, by the elite, by the oppressors, right? So just imagine we've just read three paragraphs and this is what we have unpacked. And I'm at the back of my mind, I'm already thinking this is going to be a long series of lectures, but hey, you know, it's for this. It's a beautiful text, probably the most important text in education and let's give it the time, right? I don't know how long it would take. So I'm going to the next paragraph. Because it is a distortion of being more fully human, and it in this sentence is dehumanization, because it is a distortion of being more fully human, sooner or later being less human leads the oppressed to struggle against those who made them so. Right. So because dehumanization is imposed from outside sooner or later, right, the oppressed reach a point where they fight, right, not to ask for favors, not to ask for, you know, kindness and generosity, no, to claim their humanity, right, and, and, and to claim that they are fully realized human beings. Right? And this struggle is between the oppressors and the oppressed. Right? So that's the binary structure. But he's really careful in how he theorizes it, and we'll get to that in a minute. In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not, in seeking to regain their humanity, and this is the important point, Deleuze and Guattari try to answer this, right? That was the biggest problem in revolutionary politics in Marxism as well. How to make sure that the oppressed, when they are victorious, do not become oppressors, right? And Freire, not, Freire not only cautions us about this, but he also teaches us how we or the oppressed, how do they become the oppressors, right? Because it is a distortion of being more fully human, sooner or later being less human leads the oppressed to struggle against those who made them so, okay? In order for this struggle to have meaning, the oppressed must not in seeking to regain their humanity, and in parentheses, which is a way to create it, become in turn oppressors of the oppressors, but rather restorers of the humanity of both. And this is a crucial point in Freire. Remember, we are just on paragraph four. That, the, that there is a continuous struggle. There would reach a point in the lives of the oppressed, and we will learn how, right? How they, do they reach that realization? Where they will rise up or fight the, their oppressors to regain the withheld humanity, to regain humanity that they can claim, that then they can lay claim to. But Freire cautions us here that in the process of doing so, what must be kept in mind, right, that the oppressed are not just freeing themselves, not just becoming human themselves, 
right? But they are also winning humanity for the oppressors, right? And 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 for this struggle to be meaningful, the oppressed have to be mindful of that, that they should in the process not themselves become the oppressors. Why is this crucial? I mean, think of it. The, the biggest revolutions we have had, the French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution in our contemporary times, the Maoist Revolution. What was the biggest problem of them? That they overthrew brutal regimes, but then they themselves became brutal regimes. And Freire is conscious of that. Conscious of the fact that after you have won your battles, after you have eliminated your oppressors, acknowledge that in the process of dehumanizing you, they had become dehumanized themselves. And the only way to restore your humanity is to, first of all, not follow their example, but also help them regain their humanity. And that's a crucial lesson from Freire, but also of critical pedagogy, but also for revolutionary politics. Right? So, you know, going on to the next paragraphs. Because it is a distortion of being more fully human, so we have already discussed this paragraph. This then, and I'm reading, is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed. We've already learned that the main project of the oppressed is to claim their humanity. In the process of doing so, they must also keep in mind that they should not become the oppressors themselves, that there are two competing elements, humanization and dehumanization in a struggle, right? almost ontological conditions. One is natural humanization, the other is imposed, that there is a group oppressed upon whom the oppressors write the text of their oppression, right? That the oppressed then at some point must rise and fight for their humanity, but in the process of doing so must not become the oppressors themselves, right? And this then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed. What? To liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. So the project of humanity for the oppressed isn't just to seek and rest their humanity, but in the process of doing so, right, to free their oppressors as well from their own self-dehumanization. That's the crucial thing to keep in mind. The oppressors, and I'm reading again, who oppress, exploit, and rape by virtue of their power cannot find in this power the strength to liberate either the oppressed or themselves. And naturally, because they are the ones who are maintaining that order, right? Only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong to free both, right? So, so the catalyst, the change, cannot come from the top. We cannot expect it from them. They have created the system. Right? It works for them. The change must come from those we consider the most oppressed, the most humble, because they have lived in it, right? And they are the ones who will change the world, right? That is why it's pedagogy of the oppressed, right? And I read, only power that springs from the weakness of the oppressed will be sufficiently strong to free both. Any attempt to soften the power of the oppressor in deference to the weakness of the oppressed almost always manifests itself in the form of false generosity. That's your liberal humanism, the pragmatism of liberal humanism, where we we are, we are not trying to rewrite the system. We are not trying to change the system, but to just extract some concessions from our oppressors, right? Trying to make them kinder, generous, or that 
doesn't create true generosity, according to Ferry. That creates what he calls false generosity, right? And what does he mean by that? Indeed, the attempt never goes beyond this. In order to have the continued opportunity to express their generosity, the oppressors must perpetuate injustice as well. An unjust social order is the permanent fount of this false generosity, which is nourished by death, despair, and poverty. That is why the dispensers of false generosity become desperate at the slightest threat to its source. OK, my plan is to uh, you know, stop here. Right? Uh, so what is he trying to say that the, that we cannot just ask for a little bit more of what our oppressors share with us because that leads to what he calls false generosity and for what is false generosity which says okay, the system is going to stay intact, but we're going to give you five more leave days and we're going to give you a little bit of overtime here and there. These extractions, these things that we extract through negotiations and others from the elite, from the oppressors, according to Freire, then creates what he calls the false generosity. And what the false generosity does is it gives us a little bit. It throws scraps to people, to the oppressed. But the main system stays intact. And unless the entire system of injustices is altered, right, we cannot claim our full humanity. Right? That is his idea of false generosity. If you want to see the examples of it in the real world, look at any national project or anything else. I mean, look at the United States of America. Right? What kind of false generosity is at play? Oh, we'll give you workplace compensation. We'll give you job loss insurance. But at the end of, or we'll give you like $15 an hour a wage, right? But at the end of the day, the system still is unjust and lopsided. There are people with enormous wealth, wealth that they cannot even consume or use in their lifetimes. And then there are people who can't afford food, who can't afford health care, right? Now, false generosity and a fight for false generosity would be people who are oppressed to say, give us a little more of your scraps. What does it do? Nothing. It does not change the system. So the system of false generosity stays in place, right? Little things trickle down here and there, but that dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed stays intact. Right? True generosity, which we will get to in the next lecture, would diminish that divide. Right? So, you know, I already am thinking this is going to be a long project, but the first four or five paragraphs of chapter one of Freire's that we have read, we have learned certain things. Here is what we have learned. Right? That the true vocation of all of us is to seek full realization of our humanity. Right? So humanization and dehumanization are these two competing agonistic forces in the world. Out of these, humanization is natural and vocational to our souls, to ourselves. Dehumanization is not natural, even though it's material and historical, but it's imposed from outside. And then there are then two classes, the oppressed and the oppressors. The oppressed at a certain stage in their lives as a collective or as, or as individuals fight to regain their humanity. The oppressors, on the other hand, negate that. Right? Freire's hope then is that in that fight to regain our humanity, we ourselves should be watchful and mindful and remember that the project of humanization is not just for ourselves, but we are also fighting to humanize our oppressors so that when we are victorious and successful, we ourselves do not become oppressors. And that no amount of negotiating and give and take 
will change the system because all it will create is a sense of false charity, false generosity. And what that does is it still throws the scraps to the poor and oppressed without changing their living conditions and without changing the balance of power, right? And then the next part, the next lecture, I'll continue on chapter one and we will move into true generosity. How is all this connected to the pedagogy of the oppressed then is in order to theorize what kind of pedagogy can be liberating and freedom giving. He is laying down his groundwork of what he understands as human humanity, humanization, and the struggles within the given structures of power in which he was writing, but in which we still exist. So these are my thoughts in this very first lecture on venturing into reading the pedagogy of the oppressed. I strongly recommend that you should read the book with me. And then if you have any questions, post them in the comments, send me an email. I'll be very happy to answer them. But thank you so much for joining me in this exciting journey. And as and when I have time, I will continue reading this book and talking about it and sharing my ideas, limited as they are, uh, with you. Thank you so much for joining me. And I will see you next time with the next conversation about Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed. Until then, thank you so much. And as always, peace and love.